So, Professor Danasankar Debroy, he's from the Pennsylvania State University, and he will be giving a talk about virtual metallurgy. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on which time zone you are from. And I see Harry in his familiar settings. Greetings to you, Harry, for this very special occasion. And I want to thank the organizers for having this opportunity. It means a lot to me. So thank you so very much for being able to join all of you. I want to keep this talk simple, and I want to let you know what I'm planning ahead of time so that we are all on the same page. First, of course, uh, what makes me uh, so excited about this meeting, and uh, Harry, of course, uh, has done a lot of work on steels, and so I want to tell you my take on why this meeting is so important. And then uh, this talk is on virtual metallurgy. And I bet I've confused uh, several of you with my title. So I want to take a moment to say what um, examples I can come up with on uh, virtual metallurgy. And of course, I want to give you one or two highlights from Harry's contributions in virtual metallurgy. And then a part of it is the many lessons that I learned from Harry. And some of those I want to uh, share with you. And finally, I have three milestones, my wishes for Harry. I want to share that with Harry and to all of you. So first thing is, um, why this talk? And I have a story to tell. It's as much about steel as it is about the kindness and humility of a young at heart grandfather, a resilient immigrant and a traveler, an outstanding teacher and an outlier among researchers. And uh, highlights from his vast virtual world of metallurgy and my wishes and prayers. What does steel mean to me? First time I went to St. Louis, I experienced the picture on the left, which is a 630 feet tall, 43,000 tons of stainless steel gateway arch which was erected to welcome the early settlers of the West, West of United States. And anyone that goes anywhere near this monument has a picture that is immersed in their brain forever. At least in my case, that was the situation. But steel surrounds us, you know, we cannot do anything without using steel, right? You talk about uh, transportation, housing, supply of clean water, generation of power, you name it, uh, it, it needs steel. And Professor Julian Zikeli gave a special talk at AIME long time ago, and he wrote up his talk in the form of a paper in Metallurgical Transactions. I collected some data from his talk, and you can see the annual production of many important metals and alloys and other important materials like semiconductors, their economic impact, their dollar values. And what I'm showing is that the annual production in terms of its dollar value is $195 billion. And I want to clarify that. This is one variety of steel, carbon steel. And this is not finished product. This is hunk of a steel that we call billets, blooms, ingots of that kind. If you make any product out of this stuff, its value goes up at least by a factor of 10, and in some cases by a factor of 1,000. So uh, you see, I couldn't plot this 
in the same graph, if you notice on my y-axis, there is a break. And the break is necessary because without the break, I cannot plot the values of semiconductor materials and aluminum and copper and steel all at the same graph. So what's the point? The point is we have used steel from the Iron Age, right? So that's a long time. So many of the grant agencies like National Science Foundation and other agencies think of steel as a mature field. Any changes that you will make in this field is going to be incremental. It is not transformational. I think I leave it to you to make the distinction, but from my standpoint, if you make a small change in advancing steel, you affect the lives of all people in the world. So it affects our standard of living. So you don't have to be a core steel researcher to understand the value of steel. And uh, I will uh, provide one or two highlights as to why I think uh, Harry's contributions mean so much. Another uh, clarification about uh, virtual world, what I mean by virtual world, I want to give you two examples, although there are many. One is developing a model, a simulation, if you will, based on understanding of physical processes. We will call that mechanistic model because we have to know the mechanism to describe them in quantitative relations, like we want to know the temperature field and geometry and uh, temperature gradient, solidification, growth rate, all of those things, say, for 3D printing. And what do we do? We solve the equations of conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So we are solving the Navier-Stokes equation. And then what we expect is that this process will connect the process variables with the product attributes. And that way, we will be able to find quantities that are difficult to measure, or we cannot measure so many values, or we cannot probe in the interior of the material because metals are opaque. This can do that. So this is actually virtual metallurgy. You are not doing a physical experiment to determine what you seek to determine. You are taking a different route. And the benefit of this route is that, you know, today's $600 laptop can solve 2 billion linear equations a minute. All right. And who can solve it? Anyone from any quarter of the world. The benefit of this type of work is that you don't need a very sophisticated millions of dollars worth of equipment. Anyone can participate. It makes the playing field level and it has enormous benefit to make the landscape level for everyone that wants to read and write and do something about the problems they care about. Another tool of the virtual world is machine learning. It doesn't care so much about the physical understanding. If you have physical understanding, you can augment the machine learning with physical understanding. But uh, as a requirement, sometimes problems are too difficult. Sometimes problems are evolving. And those problems, you cannot depend on mechanistic model because you may have to wait for a long time before you do all the necessary experiments. And some of them are not quite perfect. And then you try to develop a relation between the process variables and product attributes or process attributes, all of those things. Here we are, uh, we are plotting the predicted temperature, peak temperature in a friction star welding system versus the measured temperatures, whatever measurements we can make, some of them are imperfect. And then once you have this model, you have fitted your data into a 
functional form of an expression in some way, uh, the best you can. And that model can then run at a lightning speed very quickly. You can use it in the shop flow right away. And this is enormously powerful. Uh, this is a plot of peak temperature in friction star welding predicted from neural network on the y-axis and on our x-axis are the measured data or data that we expect. And we, once we have fitted this, this model can run at a lightning speed. Right away, you can get results even in a shop flow. And not only do we have mechanistic models and machine learning, nowadays companies use what we loosely term as digital twins, a digital mimic of an operating system. Who uses them? Almost all large companies. GE, General Electric, has 5,500 digital twins that they use on a daily basis for their production as well as for their research. So that's what I mean by vast virtual world. I want to take you back to 2004 autumn, and uh, this is in State College, Pennsylvania. And Harry was uh, honored by the 2004 American Welding Society's Adams Lecture. Adams Lecture is a highly coveted uh, honor, and Harry kindly visited several other places before going to Chicago to give his talk. And one of the um, towns that were uh, elated to have Harry was uh, our little town, University Park State College in Pennsylvania uh, in the US. So you see that any, anywhere Harry goes, you will always find people who graduated from Cambridge University. And together with Harry on the uh, left picture, you see Professor Paul Howell on the right side of Harry, and on the left is Professor Judy Todd. She is the department head, both from Cambridge University. They graduated from Cambridge University. Those are the people that write Cantab, right? So, so, so you have you have a majority of those people. You come to State College, but you are surrounded by people from Cambridge. And then after the um, Adams lecture in uh, Chicago, uh, you have lots of state college people. Professor Xu Li He, who is a full professor in Chinese Academy of Sciences. Dr. Amit Kumar, uh, I'm counting from the left. And then Harry is accompanied by Professor Shourab Misra, who went to teach at IIT Bombay. And uh, on the extreme uh, left of Harry is Professor Wei Zhang, who is now a professor in Ohio State University. You can see whether it is uh, before the talk or after the talk, people seek out because of Harry's wits, the way People can ask him questions, his accessibility, and many other personal attributes that cannot be counted in uh, charts and equations. I want to show you what he said during uh, the Adams lecture, and I have taken that from his website. Many of the slides and pictures I have shamelessly copied from Harry's website, but I guess I'm not the only one. A lot of people use his website, right? The title of his talk is Reliability of Microstructure and Property Calculations. So again, in the virtual world, right? And one of the questions he asked is in the red. Are experiments necessary when designing welding alloys? And where is he saying this? In American Welding Society's meeting. This is like an atom bomb. You know, these are hardcore experimentalists. It takes courage, right? It takes a lot of courage to do what Harry did. And yet, 
look at uh, what he did. This is again a slide I copied from his presentation talking about steel composition, heating and cooling curves during welding and austenite grain size. And from the composition, he uses thermodynamics to calculate phase diagrams, time temperature transformation diagrams, continuous cooling curves, Martin site start temperature, all kinds of parameters that are needed to calculate based on phenomenological understanding the transformation of austenite to ferrite phases like Whitman statting, acicular ferrite and grain boundary ferrite here. So this question, I think I would leave you to answer, but this is something that Harry asked. And I think we are still debating, right? In many cases, we cannot do without experiments and welding has developed largely from experiments, but Sometimes the experiments tell us what happens, but does not tell us why what happens happens, right? So I think we need both. And uh, one of Harry's models that we have used is uh, his um, welding microstructure prediction models for carbon steels and low alloy steels. It allows you to model ferrite morphologies, volume fractions, and this particular plot I have taken from uh, one of Harry's older papers, 1986 Scandinavian Journal of Metallurgy with Professor Venson and Gretoft. And uh, this model has been used widely by many researchers. Several of my students have benefited from this work. And it predicts the volume fractions of green boundary ferrite, Whitman statting ferrite, and acicular ferrite, which can be then tested by doing experiments. So that was part of Harry's talk in 2004, Adam's lecture in American Welding Society. I want to mention about two of Harry's inventions of Venetic steels. The first one is carbide-free nanostructured benetic steel that is made in bulk quantities, hundreds of tons. It is carbide-free because it contains about one and a half percent silicon. It is designed to have ability to work harden gamma to martensite transformation under stress. And the small microstructural scale is achieved by doing the austenite transformation at low temperatures. In case of this microstructure at 200 degrees centigrade, and it took about 15 days. And what sort of fineness one can expect? This scale is 20 nanometer and the inset here shows a carbon nanotube and the diameter of this carbon nanotube is between 20 and 40 nanometers. So these thickness are of the same order of magnitude. This special microstructure and the fineness of the structure gives excellent properties that are shown here in the red. So the properties are outstanding it's the first nanostructured alloy that is made in bulk, but this alloy is not weldable because it contains about one weight percent carbon. It cracks. But more than 20 years ago, Harry also theoretically designed and experimentally verified weldable benetic rail steel that is also free of carbides. This is not nanostructured. <clears throat> it has much lower carbon content. Depending on the grade of the alloy, it can have about 0.3 weight percent carbon, more than one weight percent silicon, some amount of manganese, and other alloying elements such as molybdenum. This class of rail steels have outstanding properties. Toughness, 
we are resistance and fatigue resistance and therefore it is widely used in channel tunnel the swiss rail network and the french tram system these and other inventions have earned harry many high so where is this these pictures are all taken in front of the buckingham palace and uh, this is his knighthood so look at the, the reserved glow in harry's picture and with his family and what did they say this is for an exceptional achievements in research and teaching all right so it's teaching much of it is in the virtual world and i want to talk a little bit about that so go to his website you know harry speaks five languages right he of course speaks english and he speaks gujarati you knew that he speaks french and he also speaks two other languages one of them is html and the other one you know formula translation right fortran the last two don't have any volume harry is teaching silently because html that powers his his website and uh, fortran that powers many of his codes scientific codes uh, they don't speak but look at the total number of documents there are well over 2 million documents in his website and um, you can see here images 1 million 80000 or so images there are 32000 plus movies audio files 5400 files and there are a whole host of other educational materials included in those are free copies for anyone that wants to read his textbooks i don't know what magic he has with the publishers but they allow him to put the entire books on his website for anyone that wants to download just think of the impact it has on the community so you talk about the virtual world this is a completely new path for the virtual world is educating about 60000 people per month that uh, review uh, and uh, read about 180000 items per month just think of the new form of tomorrow's education that is delivering today i don't know of any other website in the world of materials that has had such an impact his website address in the lower part of my screen so what drives harry you know you need a lot of kinetic energy right and you can see harry Uh, participating and organizing a bike ride from Cambridge to Norwich, and uh, that is about eighty miles of journey. Not shown are his entourage that is behind him and some in front of him, but every one of them, every one of them, finish the uh, finish the cycle ride. Okay. and it's not an accident it happens for a reason i want to also show you heat energy this is a gift from harry uh, one day it arrived in a beautiful box uh, he knew that um, you know i need some education about thermodynamics and about how all these energies are convertible and uh, i often talked with him about uh, tea how many cups of tea he drinks and what effect it has so i am putting it on my beautiful tea cup and look what happens and on my right harry is teaching 5 year olds people who not cite his work and people who not give him tuition money or grant money right 
And uh, he says, he takes up an apple and says, is this stuff going to float on water? And he, he keeps it on the internet in YouTube for teaching five-year-olds. Okay, just think of uh, what teaching means. This is giving to people who cannot return your giving in any way. So I want to also uh, tell you a small story. Uh, I said, uh, this is a story about someone whom I always remember is an exceptionally kind person. You know, uh, we conspired long time ago, about 26 years ago, to start a welding journal. And uh, this was in a high on a hill in a castle in uh, Austria, very near Graz. So we all went back to our places and uh, Harry wrote a proposal to a few publishers and uh, we had very good response and we started this science and technology of welding and joining in 1996. And he was seeing the cover page of the very first issue of STWJ. All was well until several decades. And then came 2015, 2016. Stan was facing some health issues and I was facing some health issues. So I wanted to resign. For extended time period during my uh, illness and later on, uh, much later on, for many years, Harry's answer was same. No, cannot resign. Don't have to do anything. I'll take care of it. I can do it. Okay. I can do the work of three people. I am sure he can do the work of 30 people. But if this uh, word written in red is not an expression, just one expression. Okay. And given I have 25 minutes, I would let go at that. And humility. You know, I had an exceptionally enjoyable and great time as a postdoc at Imperial College and also at MIT before I came to University Park, Penn State. And the difference was that at Imperial College and at MIT, anytime I wanted to see my advisors, I have to make an appointment. So I am familiar with the culture and the pressure that these professors are under. And I'm saying this with a lot of respect for uh, all my advisors. We told Harry we were visiting uh, UK and uh, without anything, Harry said, come down, see us here. And this is a person who had a humongous sized research group <laughs> and the secretary is sitting outside guarding his door. <laughs> and this is him. So we show up. We said, well, he will come, uh, sip tea with us, go home. He came, okay, and he is drinking tea with my wife, Chobi, and my two uh, young daughters, Papia and Pompa. But after the tea, he didn't go back to his office. What did he do? He told my kids, I will take you to some place. And he meant it. All right. This is not, we didn't have to make appointment seven days in advance. So we go there. And uh, these are my two daughters, you can see. And Harry is giving an instruction for five minutes about how to row without, a, uh, without an oar. Uh, he picks up this funny little long pole and he teaches how to propel this boat. And uh, look at the efficiency of his teaching in five minutes. This is my elder daughter Papia using that pole. And not only Papia, look at Pompa and the smile in her face. She is pulling this stuff and Harry is relaxing, believe it or not, and even smiling, looking at all those things. Uh, professor in Cambridge teaching uh, school kids how to propel a boat uh, on the Cam River. 
So if this is not humility, I don't know what it is. He is um, very young at heart, right? He has resilience of an immigrant. He can survive anything. And uh, he is always thinking for a new path. And the new path is better than the path he traveled yesterday. So I have some prayer and some wishes for Harry. The first milestone is life begins at 68 in Cambridge. And he is free at last. He does not have to worry about the uh, indirect cost and fringe benefits and uh, support uh, so many students and postdocs. So he is free in some ways. So the second milestone that I challenge him to do, and I have prayers, I pray that he meets the second milestone, is 100 classic metallurgical textbooks. And uh, that is not enough. I have a third milestone. And, you know, I sometimes have problems in counting large numbers. So two-digit numbers, I'm more comfortable than larger numbers. So I would simply say countless books. And what is countless to me? You know, Isaac Asimov wrote a memoir. And he said he has published 480 some books. But then after he published his memoir, he kept writing. So right now he has more than 500 books. So that I define as countless books. I wish Harry all the best. Thank you very much. And thank you, Suresh, for covering for me. You always have. And uh, Harry... Uh, my special greetings to you, and I have no doubt that you will not only meet these milestones, you will exceed them by far. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Suresh. Thank you very much. That was a very, very, very complete presentation. Thank you for sharing all those experiences, and and yes, yeah, just sharing a light on on all the legacy that Harry has created especially all the all the aspects of virtual metallurgy not only the modeling but also the the youtube channel and all the resources that harry has has published and that have that have made and will continue making a huge difference and i think it is the biggest impact of of all his research and and just finishing with frank sinatra is an excellent way to finish the presentation thank you very much